All right, we are Revelation chapter 11 again this morning. And we are looking at the two witnesses. The dogs are excited. I hope you are as well. Man. Yeah, sir. Well, I appreciate you showing up. I don't know if it's going to get as hot as they were predicting on my weather app. Um, but we do have a policy, if you die from heat stroke during a service, we don't charge for the funeral. So, there is that. We try and be considerate. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for yourself this morning. I do thank you for each one that's here and for those who are able to watch on the live stream. And we pray, fathers, we study the word of God together, that it would be a blessing, a help, and an encouragement to all of us, Father. We just pray you'll encourage us through these difficult times in our nation. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, on the front of your outline I handed out, I went through and I broke down the book of Revelation into sections for an outline. And you might notice that after the introduction, the sections, uh, when I was done, I thought, huh, that's interesting. There's uh, 28 sections and then the conclusion. And I broke them apart into groups of seven, and there was four of them. I don't. I was looking for some patterns and stuff. I don't know as anything leaped out at me, but I just broke it out for an outline um, to help. The Book of Revelation has a lot of outline or a lot of patterns going on. A lot of series of sevens. The sevens are broken into fours and threes. Uh, there's just a lot of, of patterns and stuff that are there, but when you look at the overall book of Revelation, you see that uh, it doesn't really follow just a real simple one, two, three, four, five, six, seven type thing, that we have the seven seals, but between the sixth and the seventh, there's an interlude and information given. And then we start the seven trumpets, but between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, there's an interlude and a lot of information given, and that's where we're at now. And then we'll come to the seven vials, and then after that, we move on to Babylon and then the final millennial and eternal state. So where it gets a little tricky is the section we're in right now, where We've seen the seal judgments rolled out. Then we saw the 144,000, the multitude in heaven, as kind of an, uh, inter injected in there. And then the seven trumpets start sounding or set up. But then in the middle, in that middle section, you can see we saw the mighty angel, then the two witnesses. Then we're going to see great voices in heaven, a great wonder in heaven, the war in heaven, the devil cast out of heaven, restricted to the earth. Then we're going to see the beast out of the sea, the antichrist, then the beast out of the earth, the false prophet. Then we're going to see the lamb and the 144,000, the three angels with messages, the harvest of the earth. The seven angels with the seven plagues are introduced, and then the vile judgments are poured out. So there's a lot of stuff here in the middle of the book of Revelation, and where people start debating about is does this back up and go back in time and then overview it from a different perspective? Uh, is this stuff that all happens after the seal judgments? That's where there's a lot of debate on that. Um, some of the things we're going to see clearly are in the future and relate just to the tribulation. But some of the things are going to back up, like the great wonder in heaven. That's going to go clear back to the birth of Christ and then leap forward into the tribulation period. So uh, it's, it's challenging to study it. Uh, sometimes I think I've got it nailed down, and then I'll read somebody else's commentary. And then I'll think, huh, well, that's an interesting idea. I better go back and look at this all over again. <laughs> so as I said, sometimes it's hard to be 
uh, really dogmatic on all the details of future prophecy. Uh, there are several points we absolutely are rock solid on about the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the false prophet, and those things in the future. And we believe the two witnesses is one of those things that's definite. So if you flip your page over, you can see we're, we're going to pick up in our outline where we left off last week. And last week we saw the measuring of the temple, which initially I viewed as kind of a separate event uh, from the two witnesses, but the more I studied it and studied measuring in the Bible, uh, measuring is either for good or for evil, and after the measuring there's always something to indicate if it was for good or for evil. And one commentator pointed out that that the measuring is provided for, but then there's no further mention of it in the book of Revelation. And if it follows the pattern of the rest of the Bible, then the indication would be that it was for good, and the measuring was to show that the two witnesses, they're in Jerusalem, and they're preaching in the temple area, is approved by God, and that there are those who will be saved, and their worship will be accepted by God. And so I think that that's the connection with this, that the measuring and the exclusion of the courtyard is part of the introduction of the two witnesses. Now, we looked at them last week. Their names are not given. And so I can say with absolute scriptural authority, I have no idea who they will be. Um, I just, I don't. Uh, the, there are many who feel strongly that it's some people from the Old Testament when you read about the false prophet and the fact that the Bible says Judas Iscariot went to his own place when he died, there are many that feel that Judas Iscariot comes back. Some feel he comes back as the Antichrist. Some feel he comes back as a false prophet. So I don't know. I've, I've always felt uncomfortable with these views that we have people from thousands of years ago suddenly coming back from the dead uh, to be present in the tribulation period. Um, but I, I can't prove that it won't happen. But then on the other hand, people who hold a different view can't prove that it will either. The bottom line is, it doesn't say. Now, they're Old Testament types. That's where we were last week, and that's where I want to pick up this week. In Zechariah 4, he's given a vision of these two olive trees. Now, it's much more elaborate in Zechariah. He sees the olive trees which supply the olive oil, which goes through some tubes which are connected to lamps. And so the picture there is that the preaching and ministry of these two men in the Old Testament was a source of the Holy Spirit's ministry to those who were believers in Israel. And, and so they were like a supply of fresh oil to the lamps. In the New Testament, we clearly see that the idea of preaching and teaching the Word of God builds us up and strengthens us spiritually. And that's why it's important that we are in Bible studies with other people, that we have corporate worship services, that we have the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Listen, I find myself that, that I'll, you know, I have preachers and other things where I listen to tapes and radio and some of those things, I, I find that it, it lifts me up. I find that it ministers to me and encourages me. And, and I've got, boy, have I got a set of study tools on my computer. <laughs> it's, I feel sometimes ashamed and embarrassed that God's given me so much and I feel like I do so little with it because, I, I mean, I've literally got thousands of books on the computer. I've got tools that can search those for words and all kinds of things. Uh, I have a collection of some of the best reference tools for Greek and Hebrew that, that you can, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire, you can't buy better reference tools than the stuff that is on some of these Bible programs now. Um, so I've really got some great tools, but I find that while studying speaks to me and encourages me as time in the Word of God strengthens me spiritually. There's something about just sitting down and listening to someone else preach and teach, that it just ministers in a different way. I guess that's the way I would say it. 
It just ministers in a different way. And it's a blessing, and it's an encouragement. And so these two witnesses, their preaching and their teaching, I think, is going to be a cause for many, many people who are saved in the tribulation. I think it will come out of their preaching and teaching. They will be a fountain, if you will, a source. And their ministry, as we saw last week, now uh, is a very unique ministry. Those who try and make the two witnesses a type, for example, of Israel and the church, or just a type of the church, um, that all falls apart because of all the details that are given. You know, it's one thing to say that the lamb in the Passover feast was a type of Jesus, and some of the details about the lamb that are given all uh, display some certain uh, features about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can line that up and see how it all fits. But when you try and take the two witnesses and make them symbolic of something that's happened in history, there's just nothing that lines up. And then when we interpret the Bible, one of our principles is, if the normal, literal rules of grammar and language give us an understanding that makes sense, why would we turn to some extraordinary uh, method of trying to symbolize stuff when there's nothing that really tells us those are symbols? So I think the two olive trees are a source uh, of preaching and teaching the Word of God. The Holy Spirit uses that. And then there are the two candlesticks because these men are a light for the truth. We are coming to a time in world history where the world is going to be plunged into a darkness. And, and without trying to get off on politics and where we stand on various things, I, I mean, you can see the incredible power that our colleges and universities have had and the media has had in getting people to do stuff, whether you agree or disagree or good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, I mean, four months ago, if I'd said to you, um, I I'm going to try and see if I can get just about everybody in America to put a mask on their face when they go out in public, you would have laughed. And, and you'd have said, there's no way people would do that. That's stupid. Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to go for that. And yet, here we are, you, you drive around town, just about everybody's got a mask on. And what amazes me is, is I'll be at a stoplight, and somebody will pull up, like a gal pulled up the other day, and she's in her pickup truck all by herself, and she's wearing this big old mask. And I, and I remember I was just sitting there, and sometimes I'd be, I get a little sarcastic on stuff, and sometimes I sit there and I thought, boy, I hope you don't give it to yourself. <laughs> I mean, it's like... You're by yourself in a pickup. Who are you going to catch anything from? Who are you going to give it to? Uh, and, I, and I see stuff like that, and, I, and I'm just like, wow. But you know, a lot of it boils down to once the population in general buys into an idea and people embrace it, uh, it, it there's, becomes a lot of peer pressure. And when we read in the Bible about the upcoming ministry, if you will, in a, in a dark sense, of the Antichrist and the false prophet, and how they undoubtedly will use the media to market their ideas and their thinking, and how they will tell everyone to be a good citizen, you've got to get the mark to buy and sell. Uh, it's what good citizens do. You can just see people falling in lockstep with that, and, and you can just see how that could easily be marketed on a worldwide level. And, and to be honest with you, some of it's kind of scary because I've been studying this for a lot of years. I know it's absolutely going to come to pass in the future. But now that we may be standing literally at the door of these things unfolding, you kind of look at it and you go like, I'm okay with dying from old age, Lord. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm okay if we kick the can a little further down the road on this. Um, because a lot of these things we read about in the last times are just downright terrifying. So we see that their Old Testament typology, that they are men, I believe, two men called of God. The power of the Holy Spirit's going to be upon them. They're going to teach and preach the truth. 
I believe millions will be converted through their preaching and then the folks that are converted through them will preach and spread the spread uh, the message throughout the tribulation. But now let's look at their protection in verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now here's where the typology gets really sticky to say the least. People talk about in the first couple of verses in their commentaries that the witnesses are symbolic. And depending on whose commentary you're reading, there's several ideas. They're the church, uh, they're the church in Israel, they're this, they're that. So then the question in my mind is, okay, let's just suppose that the two witnesses are just symbolic of the church in general. At what point in time has the church ever had fire come out of its mouth and consume its enemies? I mean, how are you going to symbolically attach anything to that? When you look back at church history, starting with the ten Roman persecutions, and then the evolution of the Roman Catholic Church, and then the persecutions that the Roman Catholic Church launched throughout uh, the Western Europe and in even Eastern Europe and around the Mediterranean, and you look at the Church of England and, and the Russian and Eastern Orthodox and many of these who were responsible for millions of Bible-believing Christians being arrested, tortured, persecuted, executed, martyred. And that continued up into the uh, time of the Reformation when you actually had some of the Protestant churches uh, executing and drowning and killing, burning at the stake, those that we would look at as perhaps our Baptist forefathers, uh, those who were just independent Bible-believing churches like we are. And I know they weren't called Baptists, but uh, they had the same convictions in many areas that we have. When you look at all of that throughout history, where have we ever seen anything remotely like this? where those who would harm the church have any kind of fire come out and destroy them so that the church is protected. When, when has there ever been anything remotely like that? And the answer is never. There's never been anything remotely like that. And then as we go through and we see that they're killed, their bodies lie in the street, then after three and a half days they rise up and they ascend up into heaven and people see them do that. Uh, they're told that they're going to minister for three and a half years. I mean, when you see all these details and you try and connect that with stuff in the history of the church, there's just nothing remotely like it. I, I was just almost amused as I was reading one commentary, thinking, now what's he going to do with their dead bodies lying in the street three and a half days? And when he was earlier in the chapter, he'd given all kinds of stuff about the symbolism and the temple and all that kind of stuff. But when he got to their dead bodies, boy, he just had a couple sentences on that and moved right on to the next section. And that's because it just doesn't match up. They put many, in fact, just about every commentary pointed out that this is similar to 2 Kings 1 and 10, where you remember the story perhaps of Elijah and the king sent men to arrest him and he sent out 50 and they said and he was sitting on a rock and they said man of god come down here and he said if i be a man of god let fire come down from heaven and consume you and fire came down from god and burned up all 50. the king sent another 50. boy isn't it nice to have leaders that are compassionate <laughs> isn't it nice to have to have leaders that care about your situation and what's best for you he sent another 50, they got burned up. I sent another 50. And I thought, well, this guy really cares about his folks, doesn't he? He really cares about what happens to them. And so the third guy, you remember, he said, please don't burn us up. So people point out the similarities. Um, but the fact is, uh, this says that fire of some kind literally comes out of their mouth. Now, some people say, well, they speak the words and God's fire comes down and burns them up. And I suppose that's a possibility like it was somewhat with Elijah. But I really 
I really think that there's something more visual than that, that when people try and harm them, there's literally some kind of a miraculous thing that happens to where people literally see, just like when Moses did the plagues, they came to the point where they said, that's the hand of God. I mean, nobody could do that on their own. That's, that's the hand of God. And so God gives them a special protection during their time of ministry. Now look in verse 6 at their plagues. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now when has the church ever done that? When has there ever been a group of people that claim to be Christians who've ever done that? And again, uh, rain is rain, and so uh, people would try and argue that uh, Christians here have called for a spiritual drought or a spiritual revival, perhaps, of some kind. Okay, then what's turning the water to blood? What water are we turning to blood? I mean, Moses took his rod and touched the Nile River and it turned to blood. I mean, the Bible says it was a miracle. The people in the land of Egypt saw it and were stunned by it. This says they can smite the earth with all plagues. I'm going to tell you what. I wish this was the church. I've got a couple plagues up my sleeve I'd start smiting some folks with right now. I'd probably drive back to Washington, D.C. and start right there. I'd catch the first flight out of Sacramento after I went up there for a little session, too. I mean, come on, if, if, if we had those kinds of authority or power given to us, do you think it would not have been used at some time somewhere? There's just nothing in church history that indicates anything like this. But the fact that we believe in the future, there's a literal man coming called the Antichrist, and you can't escape, I mean, Paul said to the Christians in 2 Thessalonians, don't worry that Jesus has secretly come back. He can't come back until the man of sin is personally revealed. And he said, remember I described him, how he goes into the temple of God and proclaims that he is God. And, and it's clearly a literal human being coming in the future. That's not a type, that's not a symbol, that's not a picture of some evil system. That's a literal, literal man. And when people try and say, no, it's the Pope, it's the Antichrist, and all of this, um, well, we certainly uh, recognize that the Roman Catholic Church has done a lot of things to Bible-believing Christians. Uh, there's no Pope who could meet the criterion given for the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. There's no Pope that's ever gone to Jerusalem and gone into the temple and claimed that he was God and demanded people worship him and gave folks a mark and cut their heads off if they did. I mean, that's nothing like that's happened. That's just being honest with history. So it says they have these abilities given to them. If there is a literal Antichrist coming and there is a literal false prophet coming, and Jesus himself in Matthew 24 said that the sign that would tell you you were absolutely at the end of the age and just right before his visible second coming, he said was what? The abomination of desolation, which Daniel describes as the man of sin desecrating the temple. So we believe we're on absolute solid ground to say the Jewish temple will be rebuilt. We're on absolute solid ground to say there is a literal man called the Antichrist who will be the head of a revived Roman Empire, which will be headed up by ten senators, and he will depose and replace three of them. And we believe that a false prophet will come on the scene who will work counterfeit signs and counterfeit miracles and be in charge of world finances and institute the mark of the beast. We believe we're on absolute solid ground to say these are real, literal people coming in the future, and that the two witnesses are two literal prophets of God who will preach in Jerusalem, who will oppose them for three and a half years and warn people not to follow the Antichrist, not to follow the covenant that he's made with Israel, not to believe in that, uh, and, and they manifest these miraculous sign gifts 
to verify that they are the true prophets of God. Now, this associates them or identifies them with one of four special times in world history. And I listed those, I believe, in your notes. We call them the sign gift periods in history. There are four times in world history where God gives to people an ability to work signs and wonders. Now you say, well, there's, the Bible has lots of miracles. Yes, it does. And remind, let's remember, God can work any miracle, any time, with anyone that he chooses to do. There was no prophecy in the Bible about if you're thrown in a fiery furnace, God would protect you. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in a fiery furnace, and God miraculously protected them. Now, millions of Christians have been martyred, and who knows how many have been burned alive at the stake. And I'm sure they would have wished there was a prophecy that you could survive that kind of thing, but the fact is they died through that. And we, we read history and testimonies of various miracles that God has worked. So we believe God can work miracles. And we believe he can work any miracle he wants to work any time he wants to work it. But there are four periods in Earth's history, Moses and Joshua, where God used people as instruments in working signs and wonders. The second one is Elijah and Elisha, the third one is Christ and the Apostles. And the fourth one is this time the two witnesses. Now, you might say, well, Pastor, then, then why, why, why does that matter? Well, it matters because it affects our understanding of miracles. And as a Christian, what I can pray for and ask God to do, and what I can pray for and know God has told you. And there is a difference. And so, in Mark 16, 17, and 18, the Bible says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Now notice, there are gifts of the Holy Spirit, but here are five of them that are also called signs. And that's why we refer to these four periods in history as sign gifts. Because they are gifts that are given to these men to call upon God and he will work these miracles and it's a sign to people that they are God's man that they are preaching the truth and so the Bible says these signs shall follow them that believe and there's five that are listed here in my name shall they cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues they shall take up serpents if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them if they shall lay hands on the sick they shall recover now today uh, there's a lot of interest in casting out devils, a lot of questions about speaking in tongues, and a lot of interest in laying hands on the sick and they recover. There's not much interest in snake handling or poison drinking. Now as a Christian and as a pastor, I, I don't know how many times people have asked me about praying for healing, speaking in tongues, casting out demons, those kinds of things. I've had people ask me to come over to their house and do exorcisms. And, and I just explained to them, you know what, Pastor Bob handles that in our church. <laughs> and so, he's, if, if you need an exorcism, call Pastor Bob and he'll, he'll come over and walk you through that. Uh, and, and I want you to just see here, and I'm not, I could do a couple of lessons on this topic easily, but... I just want you to see that it says these signs, five things that it said would follow uh, Christ when he went to heaven, that the apostles would do. And these were sign gifts that would verify the apostles were doing his work. And so I, I tell people, some people say, well, uh, I believe in this or I believe in that. Well, that's good. Uh, we'll drink some poison and we'll talk about it. And you say, well, that'd be stupid. It's a sign. I, I mean, people talked about, uh, you know, there actually are people back in Kentucky and the Appalachians that have read this passage and have recognized that all five go together. And so they actually handle poisonous snakes and they actually claim they drink poison. 
because they said Jesus told us to do it, and so we want to be obedient to Jesus. Now the fact is, on a regular basis, they lose fingers, arms, and die from the poison. It's clear that they are not miraculously protected from the poison of the snakes. Hebrews 2.4 says, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders. Notice, God bearing them witness and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So Hebrews is telling us that God verified the apostles and the prophets in the early church were the true work he was doing. 2 Corinthians 2.12, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So the point here is, if everybody could do all the stuff that were the signs of an apostle, then what is it that an apostle would do to verify he was an apostle? If everybody could do it. You follow me on that? I mean, if everybody just willy-nilly went around doing all this stuff, then you might say, well, how could Paul say the signs of an apostle were wrought among you? There had to be some things that Paul did that no one else could do. So I say all this to say that I believe there are periods in history where God did some special things. There's one coming in the future where God will do some special things. But we can't use that necessarily as the template for what we are to do today on a regular ongoing basis. And I think probably one of the most practical applications of this is in the area of physical healing. Uh, you know, people aren't that interested in healing until they get sick or are diagnosed with something serious, and then they all of a sudden have a big interest in healing and what the Bible says. And, and I know there's people that will uh, ask for anointing with oil, people who will pray, people who have the church pray, all kinds of combinations of things to do. I believe there are many people who literally, truly have been miraculously healed by God. I believe I have known and spoke with some of them who legitimately were healed by God. But I also believe that the Bible does not guarantee today that every Christian can claim a healing. And I've also witnessed those who uh, read some verses, prayed for healing, it didn't happen, and it absolutely devastated their faith. They began to wonder if they were saved. They felt God had abandoned and rejected them. They went into horrible depression. And I just want to say, that we have to understand that there are times when God may choose to heal. It's not wrong to pray for it. It's not wrong to ask for it. It's not wrong to seek it. But there are many, many, many times where God simply says no. And he does not grant a miraculous healing. And it doesn't mean that you're less of a Christian. It doesn't mean that you're not saved. It doesn't mean that God's rejected or abandoned you. It just means that if God healed everybody all the time of everything just for asking, everybody would come to church instead of go to the hospital to get well. We'd have people lined up here say, yeah, forget the Bible study, let's get to the healing thing. And I'm going to tell you, there are a ton of charlatans out there who take advantage of people who are sick and desperate and grasping at anything and any hope that they might have and it's kind of like, what do you got to lose? Well, a lot of money, for starters, with some of these guys. <laughs> That's what you've got to lose. Uh, I mean, it's well documented. People like Benny Hinn, who, when he was on one of his healing crusades in New York, rented the whole upper level of one of the best hotels there. And I remember that the bill for him and his staff was uh, over $22,000 a night. They're in New York. It gripes me to go stay in a hotel and pay over $100 for a place to sleep for one night. I, I could not bring myself to pay a hotel over $22,000. I just couldn't do it. I'd go buy sleeping bags at Walmart and get a map and say, here's the park, there's the tent. Make yourselves at home, folks. <laughs> We're not paying a hotel 22,000 bucks for a bed to sleep in. A lot of these guys are phony and they take advantage of you, but the two witnesses are not phony. So when we look at their ministry, 
Uh, we don't see that anything in church history matches up with it. Number seven, their deaths doesn't match up with the idea of making them symbols of the church or Israel or anything else. Verse seven, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, this fits right in with what we're going to see coming up in chapters 12 and 13. That, and I gave you last week kind of a summary of, of overviews of things in the tribulation. Where in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, a lot happens. There's a war in heaven. The devil and the demons are all banished to the earth. Uh, that's when the Antichrist uh, is possessed by Satan. He was an evil leader of the revived Roman Empire, but he was not the Antichrist in the fullness of that term according to the Bible. He was an evil leader who in the middle of the tribulation becomes possessed by the devil and the false prophet begins to work all of these counterfeit signs and wonders and they institute the mark of the beast and he begins his reign of terror by coming into Jerusalem and killing the two witnesses. For three and a half years, these two men have been invincible. Anybody that tried to harm them was destroyed, the Bible says, by fire that proceeded from them. And they worked plagues and brought judgments upon the earth and preached against the Antichrist, uh, that uh, this man that would become the Antichrist, they preached against his covenant with Israel. They warned the Jewish nation. So now the Bible says God allows him to start his three and a half year reign of terror in the second half of the tribulation by killing the two witnesses. Now you say, well, why would he let him do that? Because millions upon millions of people on the earth hate the two witnesses. They've heard about them. They've rejected them. And so we find that when people harden their hearts to the truth and oppose it and start to fight against it and persecute it, that many times God just gives them over to the hardness of their own hearts. The Bible warns strongly about resisting the Holy Spirit. The Bible has stern warnings to those who harden their hearts when the Word of God and the Holy Spirit speak to them. And my friend, if you've ever heard the Spirit of God speak to you, if you've ever heard a message or read the Bible and something in the Word of God spoke to your heart and tugged at it and you just felt something in you trying to draw you to just giving your heart and life to the Lord, but you resisted that, you need to stop that immediately. You need to get yourself turned around and beg God for mercy and get yourself right with God because the Bible warns us in Proverbs that those who are repeatedly warned repeatedly hear the truth and harden their hearts to it that God would just give them over to judgment. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, that's exactly what the Bible says. That because they loved sin and hated righteousness, God gives them over to a spirit of delusion. And allowing the Antichrist to kill the two witnesses is the beginning of that spirit of delusion judgment. People will see that and they'll go, Aha! He is the true man of God. He is the true Messiah. He is the one we must follow. He and he alone could kill the two witnesses. And so we see then their deaths. And then verses 8 through 10, now we see the description of their bodies. In verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of, that, of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So it's clear that the references to Sodom and Egypt are referring to the spiritual condition of Israel in general in the first half of the tribulation under the leadership of false leaders, uh, if you will, perhaps a Sanhedrin that opposes the two leaders just like the Sanhedrin in Jesus' day opposed him. And so... Uh, Sodom would picture the moral wickedness that is prevalent there, and Egypt would picture the bondage of false religion and sin. And so Jerusalem, unfortunately, 
is not the shining light that God wants it to be other than these two candlesticks. But now the Antichrist kills them. And the Bible says in verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Now again, those who try and symbolize all this just gloss over this. They say, well, their dead bodies means the church has lost its spiritual power. 